We're live. Confirming the live stream. And good afternoon. Will sergeants please start their recordings? You see recording good. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And good afternoon. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Contracts. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Kalos. We are ready to begin. Thank you for joining this virtual hearing today. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member uh, Jim Gennaro, Council Member uh, Joe and I, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and uh, we've been joined by Council Member Inez Barron. We worked with her to bring a bill uh, that she has authored, Introduction 1686, of which I am a proud sponsor from one committee to this committee so we could get it heard. Uh, I just want to say that. Um, we served together on the Landmarks Committee where uh, Council Member Barron uh, was in a incredibly strong advocate and proponent of making sure that as we consider our city's history, uh, that that history included uh, our history that involves slavery and uh, treatment of uh, Black New Yorkers at different times throughout history. So more than happy to turn it over to Council Member Barron and thank you for her leadership. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Kalos, and thank you to the administration. We're live. You can continue, Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chair Kalos, for allowing me this opportunity to talk about the bill, which I'm introducing, of which you're one of the main co sponsors, uh, Intro 1686. And what Intro 1686 calls for is a declaration of legislative intent and findings. We know that in recent years, there are many companies that have disclosed the fact that they engaged in and or profited from the commerce that was generated. And in fact, the great economic uh, foundation that this country is built upon by engaging in, in slavery, enslaving many thousands of Africans, millions of Africans during what is called the transatlantic crossings sometimes also known as the Ma'afa. Uh, Aetna uh, ensured slaveholders' interest in slaves in the case of their death or damage and was found to have directly profited from such commerce. J.P. Morgan issued a letter of apology for its participation in the slave trade. And other uh, organizations and institutions have also done similarly. So I want to be clear. It is not the intent of this legislation uh, that puts the questions of past links to slavery as a litmus test for whether or not the city will do business with any such entity. But just as we're coming to the point now where we are acknowledging that history has only been partially told or told from a distorted point of view, and just as we're celebrating the fact that the Thomas Jefferson statue will now be removed from the legislative chambers, we need to make sure that the whole story is told. And several of my colleagues that are here have, from the outset, expressed support for the removal of the Thomas Jefferson statue. And I'm talking about Council Member uh, Kalos, as well as Council Member Rosenthal, among others who have understood that this was an inappropriate uh, gesture, honor, or whatever else you want to call it. So this is in keeping with that. And what the law would require is that companies that are wanting to enter into or renew contracts with the city would have to search their past and reveal whether or not they engaged in or profited from slavery. And just to note that this is not something that's far in a field from what's happening in other cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, Milwaukee, San Francisco, and Oakland all have legislative requirements for potential contractors to submit disclosure certifications. 
as a prerequisite for being awarded a contract. Again, not that there are uh, any other uh, obligations attached to that, but the information must be told. We must put the full story on the record. So I want to uh, thank you for allowing me to introduce this legislation, 1687. Thank you for your support and signing on and look forward to the testimony. Thank you, Council Member uh, Barron. Uh, in addition to hearing this important legislation, we're also hearing Introduction 2401, which I sponsored, authored, which would require the establishment and maintenance of a searchable public procurement database that would contain information from all stages of the contracting process. This bill would require specific information to be made publicly available at each stage of procurement from pre-solicitation phase all the way through the last city expenditure pursuant to a particular contract. This information would be made freely available to the public on the city's website. Introduction 2401 would build upon prior transparency measures that we've passed over the last several council sessions and would expand beyond the only public access point currently available, which is a terminal at the office of the mayor's office of contract services on the ninth floor of 253 Broadway. In recent conversations with Mox, we were glad to hear that our interests are aligned on much of the substantive material in the bill, and we look forward to working with the team at Mox and the administration to develop a version of the bill that we can pass before the end of the session. I'd like to thank my committee staff, Council Alex Polanoff, Policy Analyst Leah Skripiak, and Finance Unit Head John Russell for all their hard work putting this hearing together. But said, with that said, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Counsel Alex Bonoff, to go over some procedural items and swear the administration to the record. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, my name is Alex Polanoff, Counsel to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I just want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify in order, so please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be the director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Victor Olds. Both First De Deputy Director Ryan Murray and Deputy General Counsel Douglas Lapari from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services will also be available for questioning. I will call upon you shortly when it is time to begin testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chair or the bill sponsor. All hearing participants should submit their written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin, I will administer the oath to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hand. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Olds. I do. First Deputy Director Murray. I do. Deputy General Counsel Lipari. I do. Thank you. Uh, Director Olds, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Hello, Chair Kalos, Council Member Barron, members of the Contracts Committee. I thank you for inviting us to attend this hearing today on establishing a public procurement database. Councilmember Kalos, I'd like to take a moment to thank you, especially for being a valued partner on the City Council over the past several years. MOX's work over the past few years has demonstrated our commitment to centralizing the procurement process and simplifying contracting for city vendors. As we have testified before this committee previously, the primary work at MOX continues to be the design, build, and deployment of a digital platform that centralizes procurement activity for agencies and vendors. The Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, Passport, 
has been a multi-year effort aimed at digitally transforming New York City contracting in a manner that streamlines, streamlines and standardizes the procurement process. We developed the system through a phased rollout and carefully considered user needs and the appropriate schedule for bringing functionality online. The first two releases focused on bringing vendors into the platform, providing a central repository for filing required disclosures and performing document management, and subsequently piloting ordering and payment functionality on goods, catalog contracts. The biggest component yet, release three, brought full end-to-end -end functionality for the contracting process enabling agencies to source vendors once they have identified a need, release solicitations through the public portal, evaluate responses, draft a contract, and ultimately submit contract packages to the controller for registration. The ability to conduct all of these activities in one shared platform brings a new degree of efficiency to New York City procurement. It alleviates bureaucratic confusion and it drives better performance. Over a year out from release three, we can now report that Passport is the central hub for doing business with the city. The past few years have seen a tremendous increase in vendor adoption of the system, with over 30,000 organizations having an account and 15,000 responses submitted to, to solicitations. This has been accompanied by discrete process efficiencies gained, such as seeing the length of vendor filings drop from weeks to days and the average length for background checks similarly reduced to a fraction of their previous timeline. Meanwhile, agency users have completed over 1 million workflow steps during this time and released nearly 2,000 solicitations. Our team continues to center its main focus on driving adoption, supporting agency capacity building, and constantly iterating on the system to make sure it is flexible and user-friendly. Looking forward, we expect to continue iterating on functionality to match the needs of users, even as user familiarity and adoption continue to grow. This process will also involve decommissioning older systems and constantly looking for disparate systems that can be consolidated into this one shared platform. We will also continue to leverage the data that is now available from this system to share procurement activity with the public. As we recently discussed, we are in agreement with the primary purpose of Intro 2401 which is to centralize information on New York City procurement and make it easier for vendors and nonprofits to do business with the city. We welcome further conversations with the council to ensure that this legislation is tailored to the city's procurement laws and would like to see if there is a way to address the overlapping set of regulations we already face, already existing publicly available information, and the need for an iterative, agile approach to software development. We are currently focused on centralizing information on the pre-solicitation and solicitation stages of the procurement process through Passport. These made the most sense to prioritize early so vendors could find and respond to solicitations in one place and have a view of future city needs. We designed Passport to channel the information in the post-selection and post-award selections of the bill to the city record online, which is legally required. Over time, we would like to post this information on Passport as well. In general, we agree with the need to further centralize information on city procurement and make it as easy as possible for vendors and members of the public to find what they are looking for. This is the work we have already led for years with Passport, and it has resulted in a single place for doing the vast majority of business with the city. As we make further progress in adding functionality and increasing public accessibility, we will be happy to continue this dialogue with the council. Thank you for inviting us to testify today. I'm joined by Ryan Murray, First Deputy Director, and Douglas Saperi, Deputy General Counsel, and we can take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director Olds. I will now turn it over to questions from the chair. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. A reminder to Chair Kalos that you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. Chair Kalos, uh, please begin. Uh, thank you for uh, your testimony on uh, my legislation. Uh, is the administration prepared to testify on council member Inez Barron's uh, important legislation? Uh, thank you for the question, council member. As you know, we were just informed of the legislation on Friday. We're, we understand the importance of it, the weight of it, and we're happy to take it back to the administration to see if there are any comments that we have to offer on that proposed legislation. Okay. Uh, as a courtesy, I'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Barron to ask any questions that she, you, she feels she would like to ask and you feel comfortable answering at this point. And then I will get into the uh, nitty gritty of the uh, transparency legislation. Absolutely. 
thank you, Chair Kalos, and thank you uh, for your testimony. I just wanted to ask, are you familiar with the fact that there are five other major cities that already have this type of legislative requirement for their uh, legislation? I was not Chicago, familiar with that. Chicago was the first city and it was followed in 2003 by Los Angeles in 2005 by Milwaukee in 2006 by San Francisco and I think Oakland back in 2005. So we're about uh, 16 years behind the lead in this. So are you familiar with these, the requirement of these cities? Well, thank you for the question, council member. I was not aware of the other cities who uh, have imposed these requirements, although I understand the rationale for doing so. And as we said, uh, we, we view this as weighty legislation. We, we definitely see the impetus for, for legislation like this and, and are happy to take it back to the administration to see if there are comments we can offer. Has the administration, to your knowledge, uh, thought to include this broad look at the impact of slavery in all of the manifestations and all of the agencies that it is responsible for? Have they decided to have an overview, a broad kind of look at how they can uh, make this assessment for the agencies that exist in terms of the historic impact? To my knowledge, there, there are no decisions that have been made yet as to how to incorporate uh, legislation, the legislation that you're proposing today, but, uh, but I'm sure that there will be conversations about uh, what that might look like. Okay, but I just again want to highlight the fact that this is not a litmus test, I wanna be clear, uh, for awarding the contract, but this is in fact a measure to bring full disclosure as to the contracts that might be awarded. And we're only talking about, just to be clear, we're only talking about contracts of $100,000 or more. So we're not asking small contractors to try to be burdened with this kind of responsibility. So I did want to highlight that as well. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, thank you, Chair Burton. I'm going to, uh, Chair Barron, I'm going to ask if uh, any of the other council members have questions before I start jumping into the uh, more uh, transparency questions. Uh, it does not look like they do, Chair. That's great. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, your testimony. Uh, in your testimony, you actually referred to city record online. And as, as you may or may not know, uh, I, I wrote that law, and so uh, compliments will get you everywhere. One of the issues we've run into on the city record is that, hold on, I have a copy of it. I'll be right back. Uh, so I, I keep copies of the city record, and I think on my like last day in office, uh, I'm probably gonna like, have a fun bonfire. So like in, in a safe, meaningful way with FDNY supervision, of course. But so like, this is the city record and um, it's got just like walls and walls of text. And a lot of that text is, uh, is in, uh, basically it's inputted if, if you're a software developer in something called a, a blob. Uh, that is the technical term for when you drop a bunch of text into a field in a database uh, versus uh, something that has more structured data. Uh, is there an opportunity, whether it's through Passport or through your current passing information to city record online, to pass structured data that is wrapped with information, whether it's XML or another, an XML schema or something else? Sorry, council member, I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, I, we'd love to take a look at that. As I said before, I think that our conversations over the years have, have been fruitful and you've often provided us with uh, suggestions for things to implement into the system. And so happy to take a look at that and, and figure out if it's a possibility for us to do that. Absolutely. Uh, can you share a little bit about how the coding system currently works? So if I am a vendor 
uh, whether I'm an MWBE or a regular vendor, and I make widgets. And not only do I make widgets, but I make widgets here in New York City. And my widgets are the best damn widgets on the planet. Uh, how, how does that work? How do I find out about contracts and, and being a subcontractor or a provider or even prime contracts for uh, the widgets that, that are just so important in this world? Sure. So I, I'll it for a random uh, technical item. <laughs> I'll provide some some basic information and then uh, Ryan, feel free to jump in if there's any uh, additional substance you'd like to add. So vendors are invited to sign up to do business with the city. At that point in time, they enter their commodity information, which will help to segment them towards the type of solicitations that are, are most geared towards the work that they do. All solicitations are put out uh, through Passport and in the city record. So there are two points of contact for where you can go to see what those uh, solicitations are. And then vendors are invited to respond to them. Be beyond that, uh, Ryan, if there's something that you'd like to add, you, you can jump in here as well. No, I think that covers it for the most part. Um, you know, the commodity codes are pretty important uh, here in making sure that folks sign themselves up and they can add to or change those uh, at any point in time. And then uh, there are weekly, there are notices that go out um, and also a digest that goes out from Passport so folks can get a sense of what all the things are that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, you, we've been working together for a while. We opened up the uh, public inspection portal. Uh, part of our conversation has been uh, just in terms of the city council, local law five of 2012, local law 76 of 2017, in terms of providing more online access to contracts. Uh, apart from what's currently available to the public via Passport uh, and the public access terminal, what steps is MOX taking to uh, open up more access to the public and comply with those specific laws? It, it's a great question, council members, so thank you for it. Uh, I do remember the ribbon cutting ceremony that we had here in our office prior to the pandemic where we were able to display some of the information that's available on our website, including uh, the names of vendors who do business with the city, performance evaluations about those vendors and other information as well. Today in Passport, we, we push out through the system information about solicitations so that vendors can be made aware of what contracts they might be interested in bidding on. We're also planning for the future to uh, put out information uh, about actions prior to solicitation so that folks can prepare for them. As you know, there are other places where we're legally required to provide that information by law. On the MOX website, there are local law one plans, which are housed within the MWBE program, local law 63 plans, which cover standard and professional services contracts. And so we're looking at ways to intelligently uh, provide additional roadmap information. And then, and then we'll look ultimately to provide additional information as well in the future. Thank you. In discussion with some prominent international procurement advocates, such as Open Contracting Purposes, partnership, the con committee has advised that the potential impact of legislating additional transparency measures, some of these measures such as public access to the pre-solicitation fact phase of the contract are included in this bill. Uh, what are your thoughts on that piece and these additional measures? Uh, and are an agency's procurement needs something that can be presented to the public at the pre-solicitation phase? I think that the information, as we both know, is important so vendors can be aware of upcoming opportunities. There's a bit of difficulty, I think, on the agency side because there is already existing legislation about uh, information that needs to be released prior to solicitation. Some of the plans that I previously mentioned uh, regarding Charter Section 312, which is Local Law 63, also 6-129 uh, of the Administrative Code, which is the MWBE provision we, we call colloquially Local Law 1. Um, so I think that it would it would take some uh, some thought and and we invite the council we invite you to engage with us on that and ways that we can figure out how to telegraph upcoming procurements in a way that isn't uh, burdensome for agencies where there's yet another roadmap that they would be required to do I think that there's maybe an opportunity to streamline some of these other uh, roadmaps and, and we can arrive at something that is, is helpful for everyone. Uh, thank you I haven't 
no further questions. Uh, I do want to thank you for doing your best to comply with the, the numerous contracts that we're pulling on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, I see that Councilmember Ellen Rosenthal has raised her hand. So we welcome the additional questions. Starting time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, and, and thank you, Director Olds and, and your entire team. Um, I do just want to say that uh, as nonprofits have reached out to me, as I'm sure they have other council members, um, your team has been incredibly helpful in getting information to um, both the nonprofit groups and the um, agency ACOs in order to connect them to make sure that um, contracts can be uh, you know, vouchers can be submitted and uh, nonprofits can be paid on time. Thank you for that. Um, this is a little off topic, but I'm curious to know if you think, given the delays in, um, in, in um, nonprofits being able to access funds that they're for work they're contracted to do, um, whether or not you think the returnable grant fund is large enough and is doing the job it's meant to do. Well, thank you for the question, Councilmember Rosenthal. We uh, always enjoy working with you. And a uh, special thank you, while I have the opportunity, to Ryan Murray, Jennifer Geiling, Aaron Verleri, Jennifer, uh, Jenny Russo, for the work that they do with your office and ensuring that nonprofits' uh, needs are, are addressed in a timely manner. Um, I think your question is very timely. We had some similar questions on the administration, on the side of the administration, and, and we decided recently to increase the size of the loan fund by $15 million. So that was done uh, about two months ago or so to ensure that we had enough money to uh, meet some of the needs as, as agencies are making their way through the process and, and to ensure that nonprofits are, are sufficiently addressed. Oh, wow, that's great news. Um, so what's the total value? now the total value of the fund i i believe don't i i should have this number handy i'm I, sorry wasn't anticipating this question but i, no, I know that i it, apologize and i'm guessing i couldn't quite hear if you said the increase was one five or five oh so oh, it was it was it was one five it was one five oh, okay. sorry for, and i think right. the base is 25 so that would bring it to 40 but i'm you know you can confirm after Sure, that that sounds about right to me. I know that it's it's. Uh, I'm always thinking about how much is currently in the fund, and uh, and I, I, I uh, but we're happy to come back to you with the the new total amount of the fund. Congratulations on that. That's that's super impressive, and I'm going to assume the payback is as it was before, which is a hundred percent. Absolutely. Upon registration, yeah. uh, the fund will be repaid. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Um, um, I wanted to ask you about Councilmember Kalos's bill, which just seems terrific. Um, would it be, um, in what way would it be different than what um, people who are contracting with the city, who are already in Passport, in what way would it be different from that reality? And again, I. I'm, I'm not going after anything. I think the answer is it would be transparent to the public, not just contractors, but is that accurate to say or no? No, that, that is accurate. The idea is to provide as much transparency as possible to the public. And so right now we've been focusing on the solicitation phase of the contracting process where you can go into the public portal, you can see information about solicitations that are that are upcoming and, and we plan to now focus really on pre-solicitation so that folks can have as much advance notice as possible. And then we'll shift our attention to post-award information. We're, we're taking it in phases and trying to be intelligent about that. But the idea is to have a central place for, for uh, the public and for vendors to have information about the contracting process. Got it, got it. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's super helpful. Um, and my last question is about um, 
on the side of and and I swear to you this is I'm I'm really just this is just a question <laughs> it's not meant to be anything more um one of the issues that's so important is that the New York City agencies the people who work there who are the contract people the ACOs that they be trained and retrained because passport is a lot and really different than what they're used to. And I was just wondering I'm how inspired. coming along and that's my last question. Thank you. Absolutely, we, we thank you for the question. And I agree with you. It is a, a brand new way of doing business. Uh, for those who are not familiar, who may be watching today, prior to passport, the city had a paper-based contracting process. And so we have fully digitized that process. And along with that, we have been training the vendor community and the agency community. And I'll let uh, Ryan speak a little bit to what that training looks like. Thank you. So council member, we, we often uh, respond to this question um, over the years, what, what you've acknowledged with us and we've seen is that obviously efficiencies happen over time. So there's an incredible amount of training up front. Um, we launched the most recent phase during the middle of the pandemic in June last year. So we're a year out from that. Um, and what we've done, it was timely, obviously, because uh, we wanted to make sure that folks were doing things in a digital space. Um, our team did initial trainings, as always. We created videos and guides and put them online so that there's self-paced learning. Um, but as always, I think the team rolled up its sleeves and did a lot of technical assistance. And frankly, that continues today. So um, where an agency or a vendor or together, they need to be brought onto the same platform so that we can watch them uh, you know, move tasks from one side of the house to the other. Uh, we've been doing screen shares for that and we're deploying uh, to agencies who need the extra support. So the usual that you expect from training, lots of uh, digital workshops and so on. Um, and then we also get out to the agencies with dedicated sessions. Um, primarily that's been digital, given And that we're in the um, but that sometimes that's even better because we're looking at the computer screen together. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes good sense. Um, uh, uh, Chair, may I ask one or two more questions? I know my time's up I mean, whatever. Uh, sure, Can we, uh, would, you, would you like one minute or two minutes? One is fine. Um, so, uh, first Deputy the Director, um, I'm wondering if you feel that both your agency, MOX, has enough staff and then at the specific agencies like DYCD, um, Department of Aging, whatever it is, if they have enough staff to, to do this work well, um, given how critical it is. So thank you for the question, Council And Member. I don't mean to get you in trouble. Oh my goodness. No, no, we're, we're not concerned about the question. Yeah, so I, yes, we feel that the agencies have uh, the staff that they need. So I'm not up to date on any you know more recent attrition that, that may have occurred, but, but we really do think that as uh, we continue to roll out our training, as we bring agencies online, as they become more familiar with the system, and as we continue to, you know, build out some of the technical expertise that we'll be able to see uh, progress and improvement uh, at the agency level. And so I think it's more a matter of familiarity and us continuing to provide technical assistance and support uh, as opposed to, you know, actual bodies, notwithstanding any, you know, uh, recent changes within the, the administration. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair, for the additional time. Problem. Uh, do we have any other questions for the administration? It does not appear that we do, Chair. Seeing none, we will move on to uh, testimony from advocates, uh, starting with uh, uh, people who'd like to uh, testify in Council Member Inez Barron's bill, 1686. Yep, I will uh, just read a bit of administrative information and then we'll jump to the panelists. That's okay with you, Chair. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Due to the large number of witnesses, excuse me, there are not large number of witnesses. Due to the witnesses who have testified today, we will be limiting each panelist's speaking time to five minutes. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. 
Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Uh, for panelists, once your name has been called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Uh, at this time, I would now like to welcome Roger Wareham to testify, followed by Riley Martin. Uh, Mr. Wareham, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Uh, good morning to the City Council Committee on Contracts, Chairman Kalos, Council Member Barron. Good afternoon. My name is Roger Wareham. I am a human rights attorney and member of the December 12th, 12th movement. I support intro 1686. Uh, the December, for background purposes, the December 12th movement is a Black human rights organization which defends the interests of African people locally, nationally, and internationally. We've been an active participant in the United Nations human rights mechanism since 1989. Intro 1686 uh, 2019 has, in one form or, or another, been before this body since 2006, originally introduced by then Councilman Bill Perkins, continued by former Councilman Charles Barron and now sponsored by Council Members Inez Barron and uh, Chairman Kalos. Even then, as Council Member uh, Barron has said, it was not a unique phenomenon in this country. In 2001, the state of California passed a slavery disclosure law which applied to all insurance companies. By 2006, Chicago, Oakland, Milwaukee, Detroit, Philadelphia, Berkeley, and San Francisco had passed broader slavery disclosure laws. A catalyst for these demands was the national debate sparked by a lawsuit filed in federal court in March 2002 seeking reparations from 17 major U.S. corporations which had historically profited from the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. Uh, this is mentioned in your committee report. I was one of the lead counsel on that case. I refer to this history to emphasize that New York City, which regards itself as a beacon of forward and democratic thinking, has been seriously out of step with the national trend requiring transparency from entities which have contracts with the government on their connections with slavery. As I said before, I support Intro 1686. The protest in New York across the US and around the world condemning racism and demanding reparations since the murder of George Floyd has simply reinforced my conviction that the problems of 2021 cannot be resolved until the society is willing to examine their historical origins and continuing manifestations. Intro 1686, which simply requires disclosure by current and or prospective contractors is a good faith and necessary first step in demonstrating New York City's commitment to address and repair the damage caused by the human rights violations which have taken place in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wareham. Um, Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Barron, do you have any questions for this witness? Here as we do, please. Uh, to recognize Council Member Thank Barron. you. Thank you very much, Chair Kalos. I don't have any questions. I just want to thank Attorney Wareham for coming, taking time out of his busy schedule. I know he's very much involved in what's going on at the United Nations, particularly this week. So I want to thank him for laying out the historical perspective of this legislation, the uh, ability of other cities, which we consider themselves to be not as uh, progressive as we are to have already enacted this type of legislation and to just commend him for the work that he has been doing for the last 40 years in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if, if I just may ask a question for the counselor, uh, and, and this is more for anyone watching at home who, who may be curious, uh, what prevents the city from outright banning and refusing to do business with anyone, uh, a corporation, which unlike human beings have a lifespan, corporations don't, uh, what, what stops us from doing business with companies that have profited from 
uh, slave trade or other forms of, uh, and, and systemic racism that followed. Uh, are we able to do an outright ban? If so, why, if not, why not? Uh, and if the best we can do is just transparency, uh, what what can we we as elected officials, as uh, allies, and and within the communities of color, do with that information when we have it? Well, that's a that's a very good question, and I don't know if I have all the answers to all of that. Um, I'm sure there are legal obstacles to an outright ban, and I think that the precedent that has been set by some of the other cities with their disclosure has been that. Uh, they once they have the information, they can then look at legally what they can do and whether they can also build in or require. I know in some cities they have they've, they've asked the, the companies that have admitted to having profited from the slave trade to make voluntary contributions to programs that begin to redress the the damages that have been caused that have been caused by uh, what their companies had done. Um, I think it's really uh, what what can be done. I think is really tied to um, the the tenor of the time and the the sense of what it, what's people's real or government's real commitment to repair the damage that has been caused. You know, New York City. Um, I know former council member Charles Barron has a whole catalog of uh, the 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 New York City's relationship to the slave trade and slavery and what the content, the, the um, effect has been down through through the ages. So I think that um, if we can get this passed, I think it'll require some real, I think, creativity and commitment. But I think we can't get to the, the stage you're talking about if we can at least can't even at least get this um, disclosure bill passed. And uh, as council member, Inez Barron has said, we're like 15 years behind the, the cart in terms of other cities around the country. So I think this, this is a real important first step. I don't wanna to project too far down the line because when people say, well, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm committed to that, but at least on the issue of transparency, I think that's, that's the importance of this step. And then we can see how we move forward from that. Thank you very much for your advocacy. Thank you to Councilmember Barron for her leadership on these issues uh, and to her husband's leadership as well. I, I, I've had chances to serve with Councilmember Inez Barron and think incredibly highly of her and the work she's been able to do over the past eight years. And let's just add this feather to the cap. Uh, do we have any other council members with questions for this witness? Uh, Councilor, you're not here, we do, Chair. Councilor, you are excused if we can call the next panelist. Thanks, Chair Kalos. Uh, next, we will hear from Riley Martin from the Open Contracting Partnership. Uh, Ms. Martin, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Starting time. Great. <clears throat> Hello, I am Riley Martin, Senior Program Manager at the Open Contracting Partnership, leading all of our organization's efforts in the United States. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on 2401 in relation to a public procurement database. Open Contracting Partnership is an independent nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., working in more than 50 countries, Mexico and the U.K., to name a few, but with a growing presence in the United States. Our mission is to make public procurement more open, inclusive, and fair. We work with governments, legislators, academia, civil society, and more who value open contracting just as much as we do. We believe that both wor folks working for and elected by New York City share this dedication, as is evident in this hearing and in what is already public today. We are supportive of having open, accessible, user-friendly data in one holistic place, and we are happy to help all players get there. We know New York City, and specifically the Mayor's Office of Contracting Services, is already actively working on some of this. I want to lift up, lift up three pieces of their work, which are inclusion of forecasting information, award milestone tracking, and online payment management. They also have an ongoing commitment to continue to make enhancements to online systems and accessible data. To build on some of this work and do it well, it is our understanding that other city agencies would need to be involved, such as the Comptroller. We are proponents of cross-functional teams focused on contract reform and open contracting and are happy to help ourselves in any way we can. This legislation does include some helpful additions for open contracting. Two in particular, it's focused on detailed award information and funding justifications. 
The value of open information on funding justifications has been important when reviewing emergency spending, particularly related to COVID-19. There are resources available on our website to learn how countries around the globe have managed to buy fast, smart, and open, as well as guidance to consider for future emergency spending. There's also ways it could be better, specifically two ways of note, clarification on the timeline and what's expected in 120 days and how it relates to and or complements or contradicts current legislation. Open Contracting Partnership recently released an open contracting legislative guide, which we hope can continue to be a resource as you all think collectively about open contracting legislation in New York City. We look forward to watching what we hope is increased collaboration around contracting data and continue to offer our technical assistance to continue to open up as much as possible in the best way possible. I will also submit this as written testimony for future reference and quick access to our online resources I've mentioned today. Thank you. When we say transparency, other people often hear bureaucracy and red tape. <laughs> Key sure. testimony you mentioned, uh, being able to contract openly and quickly during the pandemic. Uh, can you share any examples of jurisdictions that have been able to do so? Uh, and how can you do transparency at the same time as moving quickly? Sure, yeah. Um... If I can, I'll, uh, again, I'll, I'll drop resources that folks can reference in the future, but if you go to opencontracting.org, you'll see specific examples throughout COVID. Um, one, of the, one of the best examples that we always cite is the Ukraine, um, which seems like an unlikely example um, or particularly to the US, but is definitely a place where civil society is fighting for and looking for transparency in this space. Um, there, it, it, I'll go back to it's definitely a partnership, right, of like who's involved at what stage. Um, but I think if you work together to make sure all the information is is open, um, you're able to do that quickly. Again, I'll, I'll cite the, the funding justifications. If you know from the very beginning where the money is going, it's fairly easy to, to cite back where it was spent, um, given that there is a connection piece to take all the way through. So one, one point of note um, that I think is... I'll have to remember, um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but one single contracting ID to follow um, a piece of contracting from, like you mentioned, pre-solicitation all the way through to spend. Uh, with regards to the, the contracting processes, uh, our legislation speaks to the different phases. We're adding pre-solicitation, we're adding uh, post-award, we're adding a lot of the pieces along the lines. Where, where do schemas and XML and, and making the information intelligent versus uh, dumb, uh, as it were, and, and how can information be dumb versus intelligent? Sure. Um, so we definitely, as you mentioned, like to sort um, open standards. So um, open data as a concept, as you know and are familiar with, definitely means schemas that are machine readable. Um, so that looks like a few different things, but essentially someone should be able to go through and scan with a computer system all all system fields. Um, and so they definitely need to be separated. If it's behind, it's always valuable and we always fight for like whatever is open um, should be open is great if it's open because at least someone can find it and kind of find it faster than waiting for someone to respond to say an email or a FOIA request, for example. Um, but at that being said, if it's hidden behind a PDF, oftentimes different softwares cannot access it, particularly when you think about um, screeners for folks that are, are unable to access information any other way. Beyond transparency for transparency's sake, uh, are there any flow on benefits to the open contracting approach? Sure, no, great question. Um, so one of the one of the reasons we've put in a standard that's a globally recognized standard is so that you can do analysis. So we've done, uh, there are five case use cases that again, I'm happy to point to um, where folks can read more on this, but essentially those five use cases allow different constituencies uh, and the public to examine where the money went, if it was spent well, if corruption was involved. Um, so there's definitely benefits to analyze that data if it is open and structured in a way you can analyze it. Uh, the city council will leave the record open for I believe 48 hours, is that correct council? Uh, 72 hours, Chair. 72 hours, and where can people submit testimony in writing? They should submit the written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And uh, I guess for open contracting, what kind of uh, engagement process can, can you do or can we also do to ex expand engagement over the next 72 hours for anyone who's interested in 
seeing how the city spends $20 billion. Are you asking me, Chair? No, I'm asking uh, the open contracting. Okay. Uh, could we please un unmute Riley? Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm happy to be a resource um, and I can send some of my email address, but it's just mmartin at open-contracting.org. Feel free to contact us um, or find my email on our website at open-contracting.org. Open -contract um, we're happy to be a resource, answer questions, drive people to more information, um, either different legislation that exists around the globe um, or different things that we've written based on, on research ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any council members with questions for this panel? It does not appear that we do, Chair. Uh, seeing none, uh, do we have any additional panelists? We do not. Okay. Uh, I'd like to now conclude this uh, hearing of the Contracts Committee. I want to thank uh, all the committee staff and everyone who worked hard to get us here. I hope we can move quickly on both introduction 1686 as well as introduction 2401 uh, with the remaining uh, 65 days that we have in this term. Uh, thank you to everyone and have a wonderful day.